Welcome to this video session where we introduce the concept of muscular dystrophies. The term dystrophy itself means poor growth and refers to the wasting away of muscle tissue. It's important to realize that a number of muscle diseases result in muscle wasting, and a more general term for muscle wasting is muscular atrophy. The term muscular dystrophy is reserved for an exclusive class of diseases. In our session on muscle histology, we talked about the dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex, a system of proteins that anchor the contractile elements of the muscle cell to the extracellular environment through the cell membrane. As you might expect, mutations to any of the proteins within this complex would be expected to weaken the anchor to some extent and result in fiber degeneration. Traditionally, this is what constitutes the family of diseases known as the muscular dystrophies, although in recent years some gene mutations to proteins outside of the complex have been included in this classification system due to similarities in the pathophysiology of the disease. In this first segment, we are going to describe the general pathophysiology of muscular dystrophies in relation to gene mutations affecting the dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex. We will also briefly introduce the various muscular dystrophies and explain how different gene mutations are responsible for a different form of muscular dystrophy. We'll start with a bit of historical context for our understanding of muscular dystrophy. Although the condition has likely existed for millennia, the first medical documentation of the condition can be traced back to 1836, with two brothers showing progressive muscle weakness that was well established by 10 years of age. At the time, the disease was not well understood, and the weakness was attributed to tuberculosis. Reflecting on the paper today, medical experts generally agree that the patient presentations are consistent with Becker muscular dystrophy, a milder form of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which we will cover later on. About 15 years later, the English physician Edward Marion published an account of eight boys from three families that all demonstrated progressive muscle wasting and led to loss of ambulation and early death. He detailed the histological changes to the muscle tissue and made the observation that the condition was exclusively found in males. This is considered the first known documentation of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. The disease received its namesake for Guillaume Duchenne, a French neurologist who, between 1861 and 1868, detailed the disease extensively in studies of over a dozen patients. So the disease was now well characterized but there was little advancement in treatment for the disease for over a hundred years. With advancement in the field of genetics, physicians correctly theorized that the sex-linked inheritance pattern meant that the gene could be localized to the X chromosome. The site of the mutation on the X chromosome was located in 1986, and the following year the gene product was identified and given the name gistrophin because of its critical role in the disease. Further research localized the protein to the muscle cell membrane. This led to the characterization of the dystrophin-associated protein complex and the characterization of other forms of muscular dystrophy related to mutations to other genes within the complex. As we previously described, the dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex creates a physical connection between proteins in the contractile complex with proteins in the extracellular matrix through a series of extrinsic and transmembrane proteins. The complex can be thought of as Velcro. Each individual connection is weak, but the extensive connections made along the length of the muscle cell membrane will essentially glue the contractile elements to the proteins in the extracellular matrix. This concept of glue holding the contractile and connective tissue elements together is helpful in understanding force transduction during contraction. Here we see an example of an elastic band that's been glued to plastic in a stretch position. When the elastic band is allowed to recoil, the plastic bunches up because of its physical attachment to the elastic. Similarly, when muscle cells contract, the force is transmitted through the scaffolding complex to the endomesium surrounding each fiber, which shortens the connective tissue framework and brings the tendinous attachments together. The fundamental concept in understanding any of the muscular dystrophies is that a mutation to any of the proteins associated with the dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex is likely to weaken the structure of the complex. 
Much like worn out Velcro, when the muscle fibers contract, there is likely to be disruption in this complex and regions along the fiber where the membrane is more or less detached from the connective tissue support. This puts a great deal of strain on the unsupported membrane, which results in micro tears in the membrane and muscle fiber damage. This type of muscle damage is pretty common, even in a non-clinical population. We see it after unaccustomed or strenuous activity and describe this mechanism in detail in the lesson on muscle histology. After inflammatory cells have cleared out the debris, satellite cells will infiltrate the area, proliferate, and form a primitive myotube to regenerate the damaged fiber. The same mechanism of regeneration takes place in the early phases of muscular dystrophy. The issue is with the extent and consistency of the damage. Over time, the repetitive nature of damage and repairs appear to exhaust the fiber, which ultimately degenerates and dies. The necrotic tissue is cleared away by macrophages and the vacant area is filled with adipose and connective tissue. In the micrograph image on the left taken from a patient in the early stages of muscular dystrophy, we see a number of living muscle fiber cells in a state of regeneration. This can be deduced from the large proportion of centrally located nuclei indicated by the dark staining spots, which are in the process of forming new myotubes. Interspersed with these regenerating fibers are lightly stained segments of necrotized fibers containing connective tissue. The image on the right was taken from a patient in the later stages of muscle degeneration and muscular dystrophy. The image on the right was taken from a patient in the later stages of muscular dystrophy. Few viable muscle fibers remain as the majority have been necrotized. The natural history of the disease and prognosis are highly dependent on which protein is affected by the gene mutation, as well as the severity of the mutation. This has resulted in a classification system for muscular dystrophies based on the precise gene mutation. As we will see over the next few sessions, the different types of muscular dystrophy vary according to the age of the onset of symptoms and the rate of disease progression, histopathological features, and the specific muscles affected. We will pick up in the next session with a discussion of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the most common and well studied of the muscular dystrophies. We will discuss the protein involved in this condition and the natural history of the condition from start to end of life.